two, they lose Christ and his cross at the center of their faith. But we have to listen to Jesus' words as he tells Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. We are supposed to consider Christ's cross. And then after we've considered the cross that Jesus bore, he tells us to take up our own crosses and to suffer for him in this life. Jesus says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. It's not going to be easy. You will be met with opposition and hardship. A lot of times we like to think that our lives as Christians should be easier than our lives without Jesus. In our gospel for this morning, we actually hear that the opposite is true. It's going to be more difficult because you are a Christian. You're going to have to endure more for the sake of Jesus. Even though we'd like to think that God wouldn't want to send any trouble our way because he loves us, and especially because we're his children, part of his church, we know that isn't the case. In fact, we know that instead we're going to have to suffer more for being Christian. And there are all, while there are all sorts of examples of the problems of sin in this world, like sickness and disease, not every one of these bad things is really a cross. Now, don't get me wrong, there are a couple of ways to, to understand the term cross. In the wider sense, a cross can be anything that is a, a negative effect of sin. But we're talking about that more narrower definition. When Christ says, take up your cross, he's talking about Christians having to suffer because of the name of Jesus and because of doing what's right. Let me give you some examples. A Christian man who previously was the life of the party quits drinking in excess and soon finds that his friends don't invite him over anymore. A little child is called tattletale, teacher's pet, or scaredy cat. Because they wouldn't go along with the other children to disobey the teacher, to lie, to steal, to cheat, or any other kind of sin. Being called names is the Christian cross that that child has to bear. In the workplace, a Christian cross can be missing a promotion because you stuck your neck out and did what was right, instead of breaking protocol and doing what was easy. And you ended up making your boss look bad, or your coworkers look bad, and so you missed that promotion. Or it might look like not being able to keep up with the Joneses with a big house and a big screen TV, because so much of your income is devoted to serving other people, to supporting this local congregation here or other charities around Finley. That's a cross. We know in other countries there are much more severe crosses to endure. Elsewhere in the world, some people who carry the name of Christian are completely cut off from the people. Their family and friends disown them and don't speak to them ever again. In other places, bearing the name of Christian means certain death. In all this, we've got to find an answer to Jesus' questions. Question one, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? Question two, what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? Obviously, there's nothing that we could ever enjoy for 70, 80, or 100 years that could possibly compare with the eternal bliss that we get to enjoy in heaven forever. It's silly. It's silly to think that we would want to trade a good life on this side of heaven for eternal 
damnation on the other side. It's silly to think that we'd rather be a famous actor living in Hollywood, California, or a famous sports star with sponsorships from Nike, Reebok, and Gatorade. No, all these things are just rubbish by comparison to what we have in Jesus. We can sell our Savior. So many people have exchanged their Savior for so much less than the entire world. Judas decided that 30 pieces of silver was of sufficient price to, to sell out Jesus. But shortly after he betrayed him, Judas's conscience got the best of him. And he ran back to the temple and tried to undo what he already did. He knew that his actions deserved death. More than that, he knew that he had abandoned and betrayed the author of life, his Savior. In his despair, he threw the money in the temple and ran out and he hung himself. We can sell our Savior out too. There are so many ways that we can cheat and lie and steal and we end up denying Jesus as the true Lord of our lives. As tax season comes up here, maybe some of you have already filled out your 1040s and got all, all your W-2s collected together. It can be very tempting in times like these to maybe leave off some income that you had earned under the table. It can be very tempting to claim some credits that you didn't exactly deserve. And in the end, you end up selling out Jesus for a few measly dollars. And as silly as this is, it is a serious temptation for many people. Whatever trials we face as Christians, we know that every single one of them is for our benefit. They are placed in our lives as opportunities to endure, opportunities to grow in our faith in Jesus, and our reliance on God to keep providing for us. The words of Paul ring loudly to those who are being oppressed for Christ's sake. As he wrote these words, We glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. Through these trials, we grow in our Christian maturity. There are opportunities, again, to help us grow in our reliance on God to provide, to help us grow in the knowledge and in the faith of Christ and his cross. Oftentimes we can forget that God doesn't promise us that bad things won't come our way. In fact, we see today that God promises, that, promises us that because of Jesus, bad things will come our way. Still, another promise that he has for us is that when trials come our way, he's going to give us the strength to be able to endure it, to be able to get through. Then, whether Jesus comes back first or whether we die, on that glorious day, all our crosses that we bear on this side of heaven will be exchanged for a crown that lasts into all eternity. We won't have to worry about so many of the problems that we now face. We won't have to worry about fellowship issues. We won't have to worry about religious extremists trying to attack us or our country. We won't even have to worry about any kind of uh, argumentations between us and our neighbors, us and our family members. Instead, we will all be one body, perfectly united in faith. And what could you possibly give for a gift this priceless? What price could you possibly pay to deserve it? All of your sins. Jesus says he's happy to take all of the sins that you carry onto himself. And then in exchange, he gives you the key to heaven. So now there's not even the worst of your sins that is 
keeping you out of the pearly gates. In Jesus, all the record of sins that we had against us has now been erased. Jesus took all that record with your name at the top, and he erased your name and then wrote in his own. It was as if Jesus had committed all those sins. And that's why when he went to the cross, he paid that full debt. He was considered guilty in our place so that we could be considered innocent. So we know with certainty that when Jesus comes again with all the angels, he's going to justify us. To declare us not guilty, completely innocent, and clear us of all charges against us. It's because of Jesus that we have to keep considering the cross. Then, throughout this life, we willingly submit to all the crosses that may come to us. Because we know that on the last day, all those crosses will be exchanged for a crown that will last forever and ever. Amen.